From an investor's perspective, risk is defined as the unfortunate possibility of losing some or all of one's investment. It is this possibility of loss which makes investors choose between different types of funds which carry different risk classifications. For instance, some investors go with short duration debt funds where the risk is low. Some opt for hybrid funds where the risk is moderate, while the aggressive risk taker finds comfort in equity funds. But the common thing here is that every mutual fund has some degree of risk. This risk emanates from various sources such as the change in the economy, in the industry, the political situation, currency, inflation, change in management, cost of raw materials and dozens of other external and internal factors. The good news is that risk is measurable and it would be in one's interest to use risk statistics when analyzing and selecting mutual funds. In this video, we shall look at six risk measures that are generally used in analyzing equity mutual funds and how one can use these measures in your mutual fund selection process. Beta is a commonly used risk measure and calculates the relative volatility of a stock or mutual fund's returns as against its benchmark. Notice the use of the word relative volatility, which means the beta merely explains the relative riskiness of an asset and does not give the inherent risk of the asset itself. Let's understand this from a more practical perspective. Now the beta is measured against a benchmark. In other words, the default beta of the stock market or the benchmark will always be the numeric value one. Now since the mutual fund returns are measured against the benchmark, the value of the beta can be anything. For example, if the beta of a mutual fund scheme is one, it means your fund moves in line with the benchmark. So if the Nifty 50 moves up by 1%, your fund is likely to go up by 1%. To put it in another way, index funds have a beta of 1. Likewise, if the beta of your fund is higher than 1, say it's 1.5, then if the Nifty jumps by 1%, your fund is likely to go up by 1.5%. And a similar pattern is followed in cases where the beta is lower than one. As an investor, you can use this information on the beta to align your mutual fund portfolio according to your risk appetite. For instance, if you are a conservative investor, you might want to focus on low beta portfolios. But remember what we said earlier, beta is a relative measure and does not give us the inherent risk of the asset itself. So if you are that conservative investor and are classifying an investment purely on the basis of the beta, then you might be in for a root shock. It's our suggestion here to never look at the beta in isolation when it comes to selecting a mutual fund for your portfolio. Having said this, the beta does have its usefulness as a statistical measure and especially for the purpose of diversification, which can be used along with other risk controls like asset allocation. The term alpha is not entirely a risk measure, but is often used together with beta that we just discussed in the previous section. Alpha quite simply measures how much better a fund has performed as compared to its benchmark index. For instance, if the Nifty 50 delivered 10% this past year and your fund did 11%, then the alpha is positive 1%. And if your fund underperformed and achieved only 8%, then the alpha is minus 2%, which means actively managed funds can have positive or negative alpha, depending on how well the fund manager runs the fund. In fact, creating positive alpha is the entire essence behind someone investing in an actively managed fund. It also means that index funds will not produce any alpha but a zero alpha is not necessarily a bad thing, especially presently when we see most large cap equity funds struggling to beat the Nifty 50 index. A thing to remember with regards to alpha and also probably with regards to beta is that both these measures are based on historical data and change from time to time. So it would be wise on your part to not treat these past performances as any guarantee of future results. The R squared aims to measure a fund's correlation to its benchmark performance. 
This is done on a scale of 100, which means if the R squared is 100, then it shows that the performance of the mutual fund is perfectly correlated with the performance of the benchmark. This is particularly the case when it comes to index funds which have an R squared of 99 or 100. On the other hand, we typically see actively managed mutual funds which can have a range of R squared values. For instance, mutual funds which have an R squared of 80 or lower tend to not perform like a typical index, but these are far and few in the Indian mutual fund space. Now the question is, how do we use this R squared information? Generally, if an actively managed fund has a high R squared value, then it's probably structured like an index and as a consequence is performing like an index. For example, we have compiled here the last eight quarters of the performance for the Aditya Birla Sun Life Frontline Equity Fund. Notice how the performance of this large cap fund is matching with the benchmark. So it comes as no surprise that the R squared of this fund is 99. Now this information is rather useful to an investor like you and me. For instance, if an actively managed fund has a very high R squared, then it is probably better to replace it with an index fund which can get you pretty much the same performance but without you having to pay a high expense ratio. Now I have to tell you that a large number of funds will have an R squared of 90 and above which will be true for most categories. If you want to really look for funds which are below 90, then do explore the value category which have quite a few funds with an R squared which is less than 90. The standard deviation measures the dispersion of data from its mean and from a mutual fund perspective, it represents the volatility or riskiness of the fund. For instance, let's say a mutual fund delivers 10% average returns over a period of time. But as expected, this fund has had some good months and also some bad months with returns vacillating between plus 20% and minus 15%. This up and down trajectory of returns in the mutual fund NAV is what standard deviation captures and presents as an annualized number. To illustrate, let's say this fund that delivers a 10% average returns has a standard deviation of 3%. What this means is that 68% of the times one can expect the fund's returns to be between a lower value of 10 minus 3% which equals 7% and a higher value of 10 plus 3 or 13%. So 68% of the times one can expect the fund returns between 7% and 13% that is mean plus minus one standard deviation. And then the same concept can be applied to a mean plus minus two standard deviation measure as well that covers not 68% but 95% of the events. In our example, this will come to 10% minus two multiplied by 3%, that's 4% on the lower range and 10 plus two cross three, that's 16% on the upper range. Now, as a rule, the higher the standard deviation, more volatile is the mutual fund on a historical basis. One would typically see that sectoral funds like banking and infrastructure funds and even small cap funds would have a high standard deviation due to the high volatility in annual returns with these funds. But then higher volatility may not always be a bad thing and some investors might actually prefer it as it allows them to earn superlative returns in some years. In other words, your risk profile will determine how you view a fund's performance through the lens of the standard deviation. So if you prefer more predictable performance, then opt for funds with a low standard deviation like hybrid funds. But if you can fathom the ups and downs of volatility, then don't shy away from high standard deviation funds to make more alpha from your investments. The Sharpe ratio measures risk adjusted performance and is calculated by subtracting the risk-free rate of return from the fund's return and then dividing the result by the standard deviation. In other words, the sharp ratio indicates whether a mutual fund's returns are due to the wise investing decisions taken by the fund manager or was it the result of taking excessive risk. Let's understand this by comparing two funds. Say fund A generates a return of 15% while fund B delivers a 12% return. Now on paper, fund manager A has performed better than fund manager B. 
Next, let's apply a risk-free rate of 5% and the standard deviation that I calculated separately. For fund A, the standard deviation came to 11% while it was 6% in case of fund B. Applying the formula, the Sharpe ratio of fund A comes to 0.91 while fund B's Sharpe ratio is 1.17, which means that fund A gave more returns while fund B delivered a better risk-adjusted return. Another way of looking at this is to say that fund B, which has a higher Sharpe ratio, exhibits better potential in earning more return per unit of risk. Now, since the Sharpe ratio is actively used in many models, it is also important to look closely at this ratio when you're actually comparing funds. And that's because like many statistical tools, the Sharpe ratio too can lead to some misleading inferences if used in isolation. For example, it's commonly possible that a fund with low returns and low standard deviation might show a high Sharpe ratio. Like in our illustration earlier, say there is a fund C which offers only 8% returns but comes with a standard deviation of just 2%. In this case, the Sharpe ratio will be 1.5 which is the highest of all three funds but then you're not really going to be happy with an 8% return. So while the Sharpe ratio is a useful risk measurement tool and one should use it, it's still advisable not to use it in complete isolation, especially when you're comparing different mutual funds. We discussed earlier that not all volatility is bad. After all, while we don't like it when performance goes south, Nevertheless, we really don't mind it if the returns move in an upward direction. Now do recall that the Sharpe ratio uses the total volatility in its calculations in the form of standard deviation. This is where the Sortino ratio is different as it only uses the fund's downside standard deviation in its calculations. So as a formula, the Sortino ratio, much like the Sharpe ratio, subtracts the risk-free return from the fund returns. But instead of dividing it by the total standard deviation, it divides the difference by the downside deviation. For instance, in a previous example, we used a total standard deviation of 11% and 6% to come up with a Sharpe ratio of 0.91 and 1.17 respectively. Say we now apply the downward standard deviations for these funds at 7% and 8%. In this case, and unlike what we saw with the Sharpe ratio, the fund A's Sortino ratio will be far higher than fund B's at 1.43 versus 0.88. So remember, a higher Sortino ratio, as in the case of fund A, reflects that there is a lesser chance of downside deviation in the mutual fund scheme. This ratio is particularly useful for risk averse or conservative investors and in the real sense determines the success of a fund in capping its downside volatility. In fact, why this conservative investors, the Sortino ratio is a useful way for all kinds of investors, analysts and portfolio managers to evaluate a fund's return for a given level of bad risk. To put what we have learned so far in a more simple context, firstly, a high alpha, a high Sharpe ratio and a high Sortino indicates better potential performance for a fund. Secondly, a low beta and a low standard deviation indicates lower volatility for the fund. And finally, a higher R squared indicates a better correlation with the benchmark. So that's a very thumb rule way in which you can use the six measures of risk that we have studied today in this video. These risk measurement tools are rather important as it helps investors better understand their funds and creates a system of checks and balances in the selection of funds which otherwise would have been based on historical performance. In addition to these measurement tools, investors can also reference the riskometer which is available for all schemes on the ET Money app. Further, ET Money's rating and ranking feature can be a big help for investors as it uses in-house algorithms to evaluate a scheme on a return and risk perspective to give you a biased and objective status of every fund. And with this, we come to the end of this video. If you like this presentation, then do subscribe to the ET Money YouTube channel and help us spread the good word by sharing it with your friends and connections.
Thank you for your time and we look forward to catching up with you next week with another insightful video. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.